Good evening everyone and good day if you are from abroad. Of course we are streaming from Italy today and today it's a fantastic day for us because we we have a guest, a special guest, a living legend and I'm shaking and this is, this will be a thrill exper experience for us and for you all, all the fans of Megadeth and David Ellefson band and any anyway for any bass player and any musician to have such a myth with us it's a great great honor and tonight we will have a chat and a talk with uh, uh, with david and i have a special guest with me andy martongelli from italy it's a fantastic guitar player and we are very close friends and i thank him very much to to help us um, bring david to with us tonight and it will be an amazing amazing opportunity so let's get this show on the road We want to dedicate all the time we will have tonight to David, so my introduction will be very short, so I apologize if I will not read all the messages you will send and all the names of your... Um, so we will have more time for bass, for David, for music, for history of metal in the last 40 years, more or less. So without further ado, let me get inside my brother-in-arm, Andy Marcelli. Hello, bro. Hey, what's everybody. up? <laughs> what's up? Such an amazing evening. Thanks a lot, mate, for making oh, this happen. Thank you. It's gonna be. It's gonna be amazing. You know, having, you know, David with us tonight. It's gonna be. You know, interesting. You're gonna like it. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I hope so. And I, I guess so many people would like to to make questions and send uh, loves to 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 David. So. It's it's an amazing evening. I'm shaking really to, to be with, with him. I, I remember looking at Megadeth concert when I was very very young, and uh, so it, it me, me, meeting with a myth and you're playing with him with so many projects. So I guess it would be fantastic. Yeah, it's it, it's it, it's an incredible experience, and 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 it's all, all the time. You know, like uh, musically and, and as a friend as well, like it's all, it's very exciting and um, just, you know, so many stories and so many, like, a, you know, the experience on stage and that, that makes you kind of grow as a musician and, a, and, a, and a in, in the music business as well. Like uh, it's all, it, it's, a, it's a trip, you know. Like, and, and it's, it's a trip a indeed. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I will say without further ado, let's get David Ellefson. Hello, David. Welcome. How are you? Hey, dude. Yeah, we are fine. Thanks <laughs> so, a lot for being with us tonight. Of course. Italy, so where's the... F like, come on. Like, we should have f coffee, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's have yeah, coffee, we, indeed. <laughs> we already had a lot. Yeah, we had a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I guess I missed dinner time. Damn. You know? Damn. So my, 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 my favorite food in the world is Italy, as well as coffee. And, of course, the... Delicious dessert. But, um, yeah, I guess we will have a chance also to stuff. speak about coffee because you are not just a, a cons consumer for, for coffee, but you are, you are a producer too, isn't it? So a I vendor, guess your love yes, for coffee. A producer, yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> nice. Nice. Okay. Well, thank you for having uh, me on. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really thank you. It's an honor to have you here. So uh, we know you don't have much time tonight, so we will spend about an hour together. So we will go straight so for some of the questions we have prepared with you, with uh, Andy and Alex Solofogo, good friends of us, a uh, good friend of us, uh, a bass player. And uh, so let's get the show on the road. David, how did you start your music journey? Because we know about Megadeth's story, even especially because of your uh, books, My Life with Death and More Life with Death. Right. And uh, was there any event or band that triggered your interest in music? Come on, right here. Yeah, <laughs> we got Kiss. <laughs> That's the one. In fact, I just got this t shirt. I was saying earlier, I've got my Iron Maiden headphones and my Kiss yeah, t shirt. Those are amazing. Hey, man, as soon as we lose being a fan, it's over, you know, then music just becomes a lot of hard work with a lot of crazy people in a very bizarre circus, you know, so <laughs> it's, uh, so as long as we can have fun and the passion is there um, and it's, you know, I, I mean, I bought this T-shirt, I go online and I buy rock T-shirts of my favorite bands, Kiss, Angel, you know, all my favorites, you know, 
and this one stinks just like I bought it at the merch booth at a Kiss concert like five Plastic minutes ago. Plastic smell. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, look, Kiss were my Beatles. You know, I read like from the Kiss guys, Gene and Paul, and as well as you know many of my heroes. They talk about seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show, and I remember watching the Ed Sullivan show when I was very young. Um, and they and how that you know the Beatles changed their lives. Well, Kiss was that band for me, you know, and um, in particular this album, the Destroyer record, which came out in 1976. I was, um, I guess, 11, going on 12 years old. I guess 11 years old, and um, I immediately begged my mother to buy me a Gibson bass because on the back of the uh, Kiss records, in particular Kiss Alive, they said Kiss used Gibson guitars and Pearl drums because they want the best. And of course, I wanted to be like <laughs> Kiss, you know, so I begged my mom. We found one and, and I grew up on a farm. I mean, literally on a farm, like yeah. six miles north of a little town of about 3000 people called Jackson, Minnesota. And uh, the neighboring town over Fairmont, Minnesota, was like 30 minutes away. And we found a Gibson base, a Gibson EBO. Uh, it was in the paper for one hundred and fifty dollars. And so I, I drove over. We bought that. And then we went to neighboring town the other way, 30 miles and bought a little Fender amp um and i plugged it in and it didn't sound anything like kiss i was very disappointed you know <laughs> it had flat wound string why it, why it, well, it was like all like farty and crappy sounding and, and it, plus it had flat wound strings and of course i would learn later that flat wound has a very smooth sound uh a really a beautiful sound quite honestly and one that i've come to appreciate but i couldn't wait to uh, I remember I bought some Fender strings a few months later, and I put them on that same bass, that that EBO. And you know, usually when you when you cut a string for any musicians watching, you know, you you don't want to just cut this a bass string because the windings can slip off the core. So I I had learned later, of course, that when you when you take a bass string, you should bend it 90 degrees, right, so that it's bent, and then you cut over here, so that way it it sort of prevents the winding from slipping off so my a, so I, I cut it and the winding slip on the a string so i spent the next six months playing on this broken a string <laughs> no way and i didn't want to tell my parents because you know bass strings then were about twenty dollars which is about like yeah. fifty dollar fifty euro now you know they're expensive they're still expensive they're still and, expensive uh, yeah they are yeah so yeah much um, more than guitars. so that was my and i was like well that sounds a little more like firehouse you know You know, it's, it, it sounded a, a little more growling, um, but it still didn't sound like Kiss Alive. But, um, you know, that began my journey into uh, rock and roll, the bass guitar. Prior to that, you know, my, my mother and father bought a Wurlitzer organ that they had at the house. My mom sang in the church choir, and, and she had she was a big Elvis fan. Had actually seen Elvis and got Elvis's scarf, believe it or not, at a show that she went to go see Elvis in Des Moines, Iowa, in 1956 and um she was right up in the front in fact i just posted something on instagram about it with the uh a picture from a scotty moore website and scotty was the guitar player for elvis at that time and uh and it, it's funny to think that my mom is down there in the in the pit the elvis mosh the pit. pit you know yeah, yeah. and you know <laughs> with her hand out yeah and i guess elvis scarf. elvis handed her the scarf and you know she always told me and she passed away in 2016 but she always told me she goes i want marty friedman to have that scarf because she knew she loved marty and she knew marty <laughs> was a big elvis fan and unfortunately i could never find the scarf and and it's not like it said elvis or anything you know he probably it probably used old lady scarves that looked just like my mom's scarf so i could never find it in the house <laughs> um, you would never tell you would never i would never tell i was like mom where is that scarf i could never find it so Anyway, but um, so she was out. she was the musician in the house, had a great, wonderful voice, great ear um, and, and, and basically introduced me to music, you know, Motown, the Beatles, these things. So I took some organ lessons, which is where I learned how to I was probably eight or nine years old. I learned how to read manuscript, you know, treble clef on the right hand, bass clef on the left hand, bass clef on the pedals down below. So it was kind of my you know, I could that's how I could kind of learn to play drums a little bit because I had that experience on the. Independence of no, yeah, you know, just making, exactly. I can make it. Yeah, no. And then, as a result of that, a year later, I took up the tenor saxophone in the orchestra band in elementary school. And you know, I didn't, I didn't like any of this music, and I didn't like anything. <laughs> you know, it's not like I was listening to Uriah Heep and Deep Purple on the organ. You know, I was listening to it was like church music and Kumbaya. You know, 
Um, but when I saw you? Kiss and I heard um, Sticks, Sweets, Bachman Turner Overdrive, Foreigner, you know, this stuff on the, on the radio out of Chicago, there's a station, an AM station that would broadcast over by me. <laughs> and, you know, that's when I fell in love with, you know, electric guitars, rock and roll, long hair, Marshall Stacks, Fire, you know. And, and for me, playing the bass, yeah, it's about being a musician, but it, let's face it, it's about being a friggin' rock star, you know. That's what it's about. And, you know, so for me, um, you know, uh, as much as I've continued, obviously, to study the instrument, study music, um, and, and progress as a, as a musician and a writer and all these things. Um, you know, it, it, the, the goal was, okay, no longer going to be a fireman. Now I'm going to go be a rock star like kiss. You know, that was, <laughs> that was the thing. So that set in motion summer of 76. See, that was, uh, that was a good year for me. <laughs> nice one. Thanks a lot, David. Uh, le- can, can we talk a bit about your, your sound and your music choices? I mean, ideas and tone, and theory and technique, attitude, anything that can be helpful to understand what's behind your legendary playing. I mean, sure. even instruments, whatever. Well, look, I, I started playing, and because I had played the organ and the tenor saxophone, I could read music. So when I got the bass guitar... Um, I knew that you only played one note at a time. You know, you didn't play chords like guitars. And again, I grew up, keep in mind, I grew up on a farm, so I'm, I'm trying to find anybody to play with. I was calling, like, the church guitar player. I was calling, my brother had a couple of friends who played guitar, one played drums. And, and so I was just kind of trying to find anybody to be around to play. But because I, I wanted to play a certain type of music, um, you know, rock and roll, I, I, that's, that's where it started. So, you know, initially I just sat with my Mel Bay electric bass volume one, you know, and learned all the notes on the neck, you know, how to play scales and I could read the music. So that was, that was okay. You know, that was easy. So the first thing was just learning the notes on the neck, you know, and essentially from the nut up until the 12th fret is one set of notes. And then from the 12th fret on up, it's the same set of notes. Just like on a piano, it's one of the beautiful things about a piano is you can see octaves, you know, and all that it really is is just this series of, of the same notes within an octave. And so knowing that that's a, G, that's a 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 G, you know, knowing where these notes are on the neck uh, helps move around. Um, I think my sort of my sound, if you will, developed from being in a room with very loud guitar players. Um, and guitar players are always too loud, always. I mean, you know, you, you never tell Indeed. the to turn, never tell the bass player to turn down. It's always like, can you fucking turn that amp down, guitar player, you know? So <laughs> learning how to, how to play around guitar players and, you know, 50-watt Marshall half stack is freaking loud, you know? I mean, especially the old ones that, you know, be, before you had, you know, a lot of the gain channel where you're doing the jumper cable and you had to just crank them. And I remember when Tom Scholz, Tom Scholz from Boston created the, the power soak, which was an attenuator, which allowed my buddies to turn their amps to 10 to get, you know, to get the amp sounding good so you could play into the tubes and into the amp and get the feel. You know, then the, the power soak, you, you, could, cranking up. you could turn the volume down, you know. So with that said, you know, look, I, you know, I, as I studied, you know, sort of um, sound and I bought a PA system. I was the guy in the band that always owned the PA and the lights and had the van and all, you know, kind of was the guy, right, with that stuff. So I studied frequencies and, and I discovered, you know, lower frequencies like the bass guitar takes two to three, four, five times the amount of wattage to compete with a guitar, you know? So that's why the 300 watt SVT versus a hundred watt Marshall stack, right? That was kind of the equivalent of me growing up in the seventies, you know? And, you know, now bass amps are a thousand thousand watts. And and if any, 500 watts of transistor would compete with a 300 watt tube. So that's how much more, you know, what did you Volume, need it yes, with yeah. a transistor amp, right? Um, but I could only afford little 100-watt amps. <laughs> I mean, so I'm playing against these guitar players. And so for me, it was, you know, I, I was playing with fingers, you know. Right, and that, and that sounds fine here because there's nothing else around it, right? Nice, smooth, kind of... Nice, warm tone. But... As I got in the room with the, you know, with the band, 
I was digging in and, you know, bleeding fingers, right? And, you know, there's no hero in that. <laughs> yeah. It just freaking hurts, you know? So uh, um, I grabbed the, the, the plectrum, you know, and I said... <laughs> Right. And that that had attitude, you know, that that just gives you base face. Right. <laughs> let's face it. The face Absolutely. is just as important as the tone. Let's face it. Come on. You're selling I it agree. with the face. Right. Base face, <laughs> as we call it. Right. Um, so, you know, so for me, the plectrum became my friend. You know, this was this was my path through loud guitars, crashing drums, you know, um, and, you know, and stylistically, I found that I could play along with things, you know. Um, I mean, obviously, look, you know, with Megadeth. You know, I can play wrong with the guitar. Uh, you can't do that with fingers, you know. And, I, and believe me, and I, I'm, I, I, I'm the guy that says, hey, if you're playing in a funk band, you better... You know, get your get your funk chops together, right? If you're playing ballads, you're playing uh, a variety of covers. You know, you're doing weddings, bar mitzvahs. Hey, get your you know, get your finger chops together. Whatever it takes to do the gig is what is is my opinion of how you should play. So for me, um, it's not this you know finger snob you know thing of like fingers versus pick, dude. You know, it's like whatever. <laughs> that that to me is a very amateur. <laughs> you know, mentality, you know, it's, um, it is. and in fact, <laughs> nine times out of 10, when I'm recording, I pick up, I plug in and I, my natural thing is to grab a pick, you know, then I'll pick up, you know, maybe I'll put the pick down. And after the engineer's gotten a tone, he'll look at me and go, dude, what, what'd you change? I said, Oh, I, What's moved happening? I put the pick down he, and he'll go, get the pick. That sounded better. Right. So in recording and Carol Kay, who has been quite popular lately um, on social media, you know, she's probably almost 80 years old, but she was part of the infamous L.A. Wrecking Crew, played on the Beach Boys records and many, many, many uh, things that I grew up listening to. And, you know, the, I could, I, you know, it's funny now I can go back and hear when <laughs> the stuff that she played on without even knowing it's her because she always played with a pick and she mostly moved from guitar over to the Fender bass. Um, but the plectrum just gave a clarity to her sound, you know, and, um, she's one of the most recorded bassists of all time exactly. on television, film, hit records. Um, you know, so again, oftentimes when you're recording, uh, the, the and that's what I found was we were starting to record Megadeth stuff in the early eighties doing demos initially. And then once we started cutting, you know, killing is my business and peace cells and stuff, the plectrum just gave a real clarity to the tone you know and it helped it cut through and it just it recorded better so i just i went with that yeah i get it especially those days with uh, this low power amps with the bass amps i mean it helped a lot and many bass players cho have chosen that way because of this I, yeah i, I, ne I never thought about that but uh, you, it, it's really it can can be really close to the truth, I guess. <laughs> well, look, I look, I'm I love Getty Lee, um, but again, they're a three piece band, um, and he's driving. He essentially is a bass player and half of a guitar player, <laughs> you know, in one. Not only with his licks, exactly. not only his licks, but but the cut the the width of his sound. You know, they're in a one guitar band, so it's a very different experience for that kind of a bass player. Sure. Um, you know, for a couple years, I played bass for Ronnie Montrose. And um, his, it was, it was pretty much the first album and a couple songs off his second record, Paper Money. But even that was all, you know, P bass into an SVT with a pick, you know, just go. And because it was hard rock, you know, Ted Templeman produced that stuff, who also produced, you know, the, the first bunch of Van Halen records. So very much, you know, one guitar. Um, and it was, it was a fun experience to play in a one guitar band um, because for most of my professional career, certainly with Megadeth, it, it's a two guitar band. And, and the dynamic of what you play is very different because two guitars are kind of the bookends, you know, and in between are the drums and the bass and the vocals. But the riff really defines, you know, what you're, you know... You 
know, that that's what we're all doing. You know, the bass yes. isn't going to go. You know what I mean? We're, we're not like, <laughs> we're not riffing in between. You know what I mean? We're, exactly. we're locking it down and then getting out of the way for the vocal to come through and tell a story. And then, you know what I mean? That's what we're doing. So, um, but with, but with Ronnie, um, it was, you know, again, it was kind of these riffy, you know, um, you know, kind of, you know, mantra songs, but he, you know, he told me on the first night, uh, he said, he goes, so here's the deal. Play the song as is when the solo comes, I'll see you later. You know, I'm going off on a, on a journey and he would go off for five, 10 minutes and just solo. And sometimes me and Jimmy DeGrasso, who was playing drums on the gig, you know, we would sort of kind of lock into something with Ronnie and we'd, you know, you know, whatever the riff is. And suddenly, you know, if Ronnie played something, I'd kind of get Follow. behind him and, and all of a sudden we'd lock into something and we'd go off and almost write a new song on stage for a few minutes. You know, and then I'd kind of get out of his way, let him finish his his thought with his solo. And, and as he told me, he said, look, you'll know when I'm ready to come back into the song, you know, if it's rock candy or bad motor scooter or something. And I'll and I'll I'll kind of indicate, you know, the riff and that'll bring me back in. And then you guys just get ready. And and, um, you know, the, the best signal on stage for good for music, for guitar players is right. <laughs> Bang. Right. And that's what I love about Kiss. Like every song at the end of Kiss songs on stage either gene or paul someone's designated who's going to end the song you know right and then they look around and they wow uh, right <laughs> and, and they've got it so worked out which guy you know haven't played with them a lot which guy's going to do that you know you know there's always some big thing at the end and and um you know so when you're on a little more like the montrose gig was pretty free form like that you know it was fun to just kind of like you know um, have our musical cues, you know, if you're a keyboard player, I know as keyboard guys, they can kind of do the Casey Jones, like, Hey, we're coming to the end of the line, you know, and right. Yeah. Third, you know, here we go, making the change, turn the corner, you know, and then off we go. But with us yeah. guitar players, you know, we were kind of locked into, you know, dropping the gauntlet, you know, signal. <laughs> nice. <true>. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, David, you have some very nice portrait of, over there behind you. And I guess Andy has a special question for you about one of those. I guess he's the one on the very top on the left, isn't it, Andy? Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the Big Four experience. How, uh -huh. you know, because the, the way we lived that, you know, that that, that event, the, it was like crazy. You know, I, I went to see you guys in Milan. Yeah. And, and, and it was, you know, like a like a dream come true like seeing you, the, the four of, of you together jamming in the end and just you know right and it was crazy so by, by your you know side you know so it's how, funny how you know on, on your side obviously it's big and you know and and it was for sure you know in our side it's basically just battle of the bands like in high school you know uh <laughs> <laughs> because you know we're, we're we've i think probably you know that was what 2010 or 11 i guess when 11 we did that, right? i think so by then, look, at that point, we've had 30-year careers. We've all been to the top of the mountain. We've gotten our Grammy nominations or wins, our gold platinum records. We've done, we've done the whole thing, right? We've been to the top of the mountain. We've seen the view. So coming together then was a very different experience because we came together really as friends and brothers and, and celebrating what we'd created together. And the combined effort of all of us took us into the stadiums. Um, and if Grant, look, Grant and Metallica can do stadiums on their own uh, as well. Um, this just added an extra punch for sure, you know, so certainly, uh, you know, cert very grateful to Metallica for offering that to us because it brought Slayer Megadeth Anthrax up to that level. Um, and I think it, it gave Metallica a nice, good metal, thrash metal cred again. You know, they'd been exploring for a few years with stuff. So I think I think we all won. You know, everybody wins on that, which was great. Um, you know, you fast forward to the beginning. Um, and, uh, you know, then it, you know, it was competitive. I mean, we were still friends um, back then. Um, our band, of course, maybe being a bit of the outside because of the history with Dave, okay. you know, okay. departing Metallica. So there was okay. very much a different, I think, feeling from him years ago. And, and, and maybe 
the motivation for for his just relentless drive with Megadeth. And I'm glad he had that because when I moved to California in, in 1983, right out of high school, and I met him, that's that was the kind of person and people I was looking to, to hook up with because I'm that guy when I was growing up in Minnesota. Andy, you and I know every day we're on WhatsApp sharing riffs and writing every songs. Day. So, every I mean, single day. <laughs> we're, we're doing that to anyway, you know what I mean, to this day. I mean, exactly. we're, we're still... We're still those guys. We're just trying to make it. One day we'll make exactly. it. You know, exactly. that's, that's, there's no Sunday. There's no Saturday. Yeah. You don't know. It's, it's just a continuous. You know, it, just... it is, and it's done from the just the passion of it all. And you know, nothing's greater than when you stumble onto an idea and you can share it with a, a buddy or your bandmates, and and it, it get it, then it grows into something bigger, and the you know the exploration of that just gets bigger and bigger. Um, and so. Um, you know, it, 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 you know, it's, it's interesting that the four of us, we each had sort of the four pillars of, of a genre. Um, and, you know, they call us the big four because we were the four um, that got to the top. You know, uh, there was, of course, there's Exodus, there's Overkill, there's Testament, there's, there's others in the genre. I guess the four of us were just, you know, knighted, you know, from the powers yeah, that yeah. be to, you know, <laughs> yeah. to get the major label deals and do it. And, and I look, I think the quality of our materials has stood the test of time for sure. You know, there was an, there was an access into the mainstream. There was a sort of visceral connection globally to, to an audience that, that looked to us as their heroes and, um, you know, the same way I did with these guys and with kiss, you know, exactly. with kiss and, you know, so, um, we're all just kind of doing what our heroes did before us, you know. I think that's the, the the reality of it. And certainly, look, Metallica went to the top first, you know, and they 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 broke down doors for all of us that made the whole thing work. I mean, let's let's give credit where credit's due, you know. So, uh, I mean, myself, I'm kind of a branch off the Metallica family tree by way of playing with Dave, who was in Metallica, and, you know, Kerry King, who played in Megadeth. So, I mean, it's like it's yeah. all kind of you know, if you put it into heavymetalancestry.com and spit into the cup and got your heavy metal DNA exactly. back, you know, there would be... You're going to get be, the test, the test, and, the, and you, you see Right, that. yeah. The yeah. roots would go down, the tree, the branches would go out, and it's, it's yeah. yeah, we're all a bunch of, you know, illegitimate children from the same family tree, you know. Yeah. Um, Exodus, you know, uh, you know, Gary Holt, Kirk Hammett, you know, and Gary Poison Slayer, and on and on it goes. And, and, it, and I, I think that's the fun of it, you know, is that that we were a like-minded bunch of uh, kids who got to grow up together. Um, and, you know, but, you know, when you, when, when you get on stage, you know, there's kind of this huddle, and you go, all right, let's go fucking kick these guys' ass. You know what I mean? I don't <laughs> care who you are. That happens all the time. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Happens, you know. And I think what was fun on the big four so was true. that everybody, I remember James and Lars being on the side of the stage, and we'd all go watch Anthrax, and then, you know, we'd, you know, we'd hang and watch Slayer. And, and so there was always this thing where we were kind of on the side cheering each other on, you know, like going, yeah, this is, how freaking cool is this, man? We're playing these big 60,000 stadium, seat stadiums, and, and, and it's us. It's our genre. Like, these are our buddies. We all grew up together. We're all still alive. We're all still here. Our bands are still making records. We're still, uh, we're still in it, you know. And, carrying and the torch. It, know, yeah, like and, and that, was, that was a celebration. So it was definitely, you know, not, it was way less competitive and way more friendly for sure, which I thought was really the highlight for me of the whole thing. Yeah, thank you. It's really? a it's a nice testimony also to have this cooperation together with Metallica, Anthrax, and Megadeth. So it was an amazing show that that night. I remember it thank in you. Milan uh, about ten years ago. It was two thousand eleven. I, I guess. Or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we could have probably taken it all around the world. I, mean, I think every fan would have wanted to see that. You know, I think at some point, That's it's, for sure. Uh, you know, it 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 was it was by its design being limited made it that much more special yet at the same time we probably could have just done a whole world always, tour and just hung it up and retired and said all right done with that now well now what do we do you know now we <laughs> yeah. turn into gardeners or something i don't know <laughs> gardeners <laughs> <laughs> heavy metal gardeners <laughs> <You know. laughs> listen david what are your plans for the futures for, for the future in terms of new album releases and tours etc i know something about about the project with Andy, but I'm very right. curious to to ask from your own voice, you know? 
Yeah, well, look, we, you know, in, hovering in the background for the last few years has been the new Megadeth album. And, um, you know, that is uh, being completed. Uh, people keep asking when we hear new music. And, and look, I think something of that size uh, has to sort of launch around touring. Um, and so the fact that we're able to kind of sit on the sidelines with that, um, we've got stuff obviously on the calendar, but, you know, it's all pandemic permitting you know what i mean so i think on that something of that size um it'll it'll you know it'll launch uh as the world allows it to you know with the pandemic and touring um you know i'm always working on a handful of things i've got you know i'm i'm, I'm a guy that just says yes uh and especially when it's my friends calling and we're, we're doing stuff um you know andy and i did this uh just no cover record under no the color. ellison band name and um, and that in and of itself was kind of a, a pivot last year in 2020 because we had put out a couple songs, a song called Simple Truth, and then we launched um, a Post Malone cover called Over Now that we put out. And those were intended to be part of a uh, Ellison full-length LP of, of mostly original material. And once we realized the pandemic is here and the touring's canceled, we just quickly, you know, just decided by like early June, we just said, hey, let's just do some covers. And um, some covers turned out to be 19 covers <laughs> for a double CD. Some. No, just co couple, yes, just some. Know. And, just some and cover, yeah. <laughs> so that that's where that came from. And that came out November 20th. Um, and we were able to get that out. And, and, I, and I think in a lot of ways, kind of a, a shining bright spot at the end of a you know otherwise kind of troublesome and turbulent year for our our friends in the business and in our industry uh that was mostly just shut down so we were able to um you know to keep working and it's funny you know looking at the visual of me and andy because i'm what eight hours behind you guys right now in here and yeah. and i'll i'll uh i'll come up with an idea I'll email or WhatsApp it over to Andy. So when he wakes up in the morning, he's, he's, you know, I'll say, Hey man, what do you think we do this song? Or, Hey, check out these couple riffs. And he goes, man, I'm on it. And next thing you know, by the time I go to bed, he sent back a completely fully produced sort of <laughs> demo of it. And then I'll sit here and I'll plug into Andy hooked me up with IK multimedia. So I sit here literally through this ax I own plug in and start. And you know, yeah. I'll just start riffing bass on stuff. And and between us, you know, we're like making demos. It's kind of a 24-hour around-the-clock studio that we have here. You know, we're like heavy metal Motown working exactly. around the clock. Yeah, um, keep producing album. Keep producing. <laughs> now, like today I woke up and I'm going to the gym and, and I'm, I'm, I'm literally like on the machine and I'm listening to a demo reading some lyrics that Andy had sent over and he's singing and, you know, making these, uh, yeah, there they are. There's those two oh, guys. Yeah, love, it. love <laughs> this show. Yeah. And, and so we were, uh, and so that's how we write. And, and it's, it's so great to have a, you know, a friend like Andy and have the collaboration we have, you know, Andy has introduced us to, you know, Paulo Caridi on drums from Alessio. Uh, is it Garavello or Garavello? Alessio Garavello, yeah. yeah. Garavello, yeah. So Garavello. he's up in London. We finish things, send them to him, fixes it. He makes us sound like we know what we're doing and makes it like real, like a real record, um, puts the polish on it. And, um, you know, so Andy has really just, you know, uh, been a wonderful team. I mean, I pretty much dubbed Andy the musical director for the Ellison Band. Um, and you know, I throw a lot of stuff at Andy. I just sort of dump, you know, piles of stuff. And I'm like, just, here, dude, can you can you figure this out? That, yeah, make sense you know, of these ideas. Um, he and, likes challenges. Yeah, and it's he, and he yeah, does, I, and he and he's great at it. And Andy's just you know been such a such a great uh, you know just you know we're we're a team you know. And that to me is to me that's what band. You know, I never wanted to be a solo artist. I always wanted to be in a band. And even though Ellison has my last name on it, like we're a band, you know, it's a group and we all have our role. We all have our place in it. And we all have a, a collaborative um, participation. You know, to me, a band was, you know, like being in a gang, you know, in, high, in, high, in school, there's that moment where you're exactly. either going to be a nerd you're going to be a dropout and, you know, a druggie or you're going to be a jock, you know, or and, 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 and there's always these very few weirdos like us that become these sort of 
rock and roll musicians because we're a completely cut from a different cloth, you know, and there's there's only a couple of us. <laughs> Um, because we're right almost just above the burnout drug at druggy level, right? Because we're long hair. We look like we don't belong, like we're going to be losers. Like Yet we don't belong, of, exactly. <laughs> inside of us, there's this, there is this real God-given talent and ability. And, and I think most importantly, there's a drive and there's a vision and there's a, you know, again, you know, the template was set, like, I'm going to go do that. And so it, as much as we may appear somewhat some uh, antisocial, at certain times, you know, it's in our quiet time and in our time away from, you know, just going to the football game and just out doing the kind of normal everyday stuff. It's in those times when we're at home playing our guitars, practicing, writing songs, working on things that that that's when our creative energy really works. And um, and we need that alone time. And I think, quite honestly, this pandemic um, I think has probably as as much as it freaked us out because it sidelined us off tours and these big fun things we get to do. In a lot of ways, I think for our community, it 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 put us into a a different mindset, a different shift. To go, okay, I'm at home. Let me let me pick up my instrument. Let's write. Let's let's you know let's get busy. You know let's let's create stuff. So, um, you know, here in America we call them Super Bowl babies. You know, it's the Super Bowl's always kind of <laughs> like Super first Bowl February. Babies. And then usually like nine months later, there's a whole bunch of babies that, you know, are born because people were snuggling up watching the Super Bowl. Much. Yeah. So I think we're kind of in that same thing. We're going to have a lot of pandemic babies come at record. Well, probably literally babies, but also musical creations coming down the pike. Like, um, and that's why, again, I'm glad we did that with, uh, you know, with no cover. You know, I think we... Yeah. You know, we we hit one. So and it's powerful. Know. It's very powerful. It's a, you can tell it it's it's good fun. It was good fun for us. You know, it, it was. Yeah, it's, it's not something we had to do. It's something we wanted to. We wanted to do. You know, and, and yeah, it's, exactly. And and it's you know, and it's fun when you start to develop a sound. I think that's the one of the more difficult things is, you know, is creating a, a sound. Um, you know, because you know, I have a sound. Andy's got a, 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 not only does Andy have a sound, he's also got a versatile sound, which is needed for the things that he's made his living doing um, in, the, in the groups he's played in. I've, you know, we hired him to play with me and Frank Bello. We uh, did a tour supporting Slash a couple years ago, and Andy was able to slide in and, and really just kind of pick up what we were doing. In the Ellison Band, Andy and I are creating something new together. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's an interesting world right now. Obviously, in Megadeth, you know, when I go into that, it's, it's a very, it's that dimension. Just be, be the Megadeth guy, you know. So um, I enjoy having all these different platforms and these different outlets because it, it, it's fun to not just be a one-trick pony. And I think as a bass player, it's interesting. I get to be an artist. I get to be my own guy, write my own songs. And then I also get to uh, play in these group settings where um, you're just a member amongst members, you know, and it's like, hey man, just be the bass player. So it's it's fun to be able to have both of those. Yeah, it's exciting uh, for some yeah, some reasons. It's, it's exciting because all you know you're not doing the same same old every every day and every, you know through the years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like the thing with Frank Bello, you know, <clears throat> we were during the Big Four tour. Um, uh, Frank came over and started playing Harky amplifiers which i had played you know largely through most of my megadeth career i started back in i guess 1987 um it was funny me and dave mustaine and chris poland we went down to go see judas priest on the turbo they were touring on the turbo tours we went to the sports arena in la and dockin was opening for him and i love dockin i think they're one of the cool bands from that you know the the kind of the sunset strip uh bands that you know rat motley um you know, and, and Doc, and then they, they, they had a great sound. And, and Jeff Pilson was playing a Jackson bass and into his SVTs, and he plays the pick. And his tone was freaking awesome, man. It was so good. And I, I literally went, like, the next day to Guitar Center uh, on Sunset Boulevard, which is their big flagship store there. And I pulled a Jackson bass off the shelf, and I plugged it into a uh, – it was a Galleon Kruger 800 RB, and it was into a pair of Harky cabinets. And I was like – and that, that just that tone was born. <laughs> right? I was like, oh my God, there it is. And it just my tone was born. Dave and I called um 
Grover Jackson, who still owned Jackson at that time, we went out there and he custom made from basically this, this in fact, this particular base, it's a, it's a reissue, but this is the latest David Ellison Jackson base. And this is a re exact recreation of that very the first base one. Grover made yeah. for me back in 1987. So uh, wow. he made Dave. Um, Dave wanted a 22 or 24 fret flying V, uh, which they had never made before. So that became his instrument, and and you know the Quicksilver is designated as my color inside of Jackson. So I've had a long history with them. But then the Harky amps became, um, you know, a big part of the, that sound. The aluminum cone back then of those speakers provided that you know all that that spank, you know that. Right, it just it, and and even here it's because it, I'm di I'm just direct. You don't really get the sizzle. Still with the heart gets key. the sound. Get the, yeah. the tone. The tone. The tone is here. The tone is that we all want to hear. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, so the harky again, just you know, in our in Megadeth, of course, you know, it's it's a it's a Marshall guitar sound, which eats up most of the mid range, right? So where do I fit? Well, I try to get the harky gets me down under, right? So get some nice bottom, get down inside the kick drum. And then it, because the my tone curve has, uh, you, if, if you looked at it on the graphic EQ, it's what they call the California smile, right? So, so bass boosted, mid scooped, treble high, right? They call that the California smile, right? So Yeah, the smile. It, yeah. It's the same thing. So I'm yeah. down in the kick. I'm smiling out of the way of the marshals and then landing up here on the top where the, you know, the whole like... You know, that, that, that twangy thing up there, you know? So... Yeah. Um, that's, you know, that's essentially, if you visualized my tone, that's, that's kind of the building blocks of, of what it looks like. So, um, but I don't know where that, oh yeah. So me and Frank, we're doing Harky. So <laughs> I digress. <laughs> so we moved to 2010 and 11. And I said to Frank, I, you know, we're, we're kind of just doing these clinics. We're playing along to Megadeth and Anthrax, you know, MP3s, you know, <laughs> which is, you know, if I'm going to play to a Megadeth song, I'd rather just do it in Megadeth with my friends and let's go. You know, On stage. So, yeah. so I, I said to Frank, I said, let's write some songs. We at least have some backing tracks for these clinics that we're doing. And that's what started what became Altitudes and Attitude. And I, I brought a song in that was pretty riffy, designed, you know, that we could kind of strip it down and just turn it into a bass clinic if we needed <clears> to. Um, and then Frank brought in these songs that were just, I mean, just beautiful you know, him with an electric guitar just kind of jangling through these parts. Um, anything from kind of a U2 to Cheap Trick, you know, and this did really different sound. And um, and I picked up the bass, and, and I just, like... You know, just it was this whole different type of playing that was. There's an era of when I was growing up. Uh, I call it the skinny tie new wave, which was like the Cars, um, Joe Jackson, um, yeah. you know, Gary Newman. You know, is this really kind of you know cool uh, new wave rock sound? It was not metal, um, and some of the bass playing in that was just phenomenal. Um, so Graham maybe in particular who played with Joe Jackson, I thought had such a great tone. Uh, there's a tubes record called the, is it the completion backwards principle? Is that the name of it? Mm -hmm. Um, Steve Lukather wrote a lot of the tracks on it and played on it. And the bass playing is super cool. A song called talk to you later, things like that. And it's got these really aggressive pick bass lines, you know, and, and I just love it because the bass drives the song. So I took that same approach when I was working with Frank, you know, to obviously we want to hear his voice and these, these nice kind of strummy chords that he was playing sort of flowered the song out. And then I thought, well, let me and Jeff Friedel, who plays in a perfect circle, we had him play drums on it. So I said, look, let's, why don't we just kind of carve down the middle, um, you know, they just come almost like these, just like. You know, just kind of almost U2, you know, just exactly. like. 
just really just kind of laying it down, keep it, just anchor it. Um, and, and what's beautiful about that type of music is that the, you know, the guitars, you know, you kind of let the, the vocal just sort of kinda float in the air, off. You know, kinda, yeah. yeah just, just and then underneath it, it, you know. You know, the, the bass can be very creative in moving the, the, the anchoring root notes around underneath of it. And so everybody gets to do their own thing, yet it all creates this nice tapestry within the song. And, um, and that was, you know, again, Andy uh, joined us on the stage, you know, to tour that because um, yeah. it needed an energy. And one, if you need energy, you call Andy Martin Jelly because he's, <laughs> he's it's funny. I, I, had a, I had a little cover band called Hail, and it was me, Andreas Kisser, Tim Ripper Owens, and there was a few drummers, Jimmy DeGrasso, Roy Mayorga, Mike Portnoy sat in with us. And, and I tell you, every time we got on that deck, when, when Andreas plugged into his Marshall and turned it up to like nine and a half, right? That, that was the yeah. volume. That was the level. I guess we're this all rising 11. up to Andreas's level. And, Mart, and Andy's the same thing. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he has a power, you know, he's the Italian bull, you know what I mean? It just freaking <laughs> goes to this, this intensity level. Um, and on a gig like that, it was, it was cool because, uh, it required a lot of nuance, um, you know, and, and a lot of, there's, there's just a lot of air, you know, in those songs and they needed to breathe and, Candy. and yeah. And the hook was the, of course the song, the other hook was, you know, hearing Frank, like Frank was singing and, yeah. um, you know, and, and as Frank did more of it, he got more confident in it. I told him from the beginning to dude, your, your voice is freaking beautiful. Like don't I even love worry it. about it. I love it as well. I mean, he's got a great voice. Like great that. voice. Yeah. And, and the good thing, and I remember that we had like three hours, three hours re rehearsal before starting the tour. Right. <laughs> and we're, most of it, we were sitting there being much. the Beach Boys, figuring out vocal, har the harmonies, right? Exactly. Because, we still uh, have kind of like clips from you know, we WhatsApp. And yeah. we're, <laughs> we're standing there like the Four Seasons, Frankie Valley back there, like, you know, all it's right, like, let's take it down one more time. You know, we're doing yeah. these like three and four. Only four BVs, harmonies. only back in vocals, only singing mo yeah. Yeah. instead of playing. You know, it was like. It was cool. Yeah, because normally guy, as musicians, right. we get all shreddy. We're sitting backstage shredding our parts. And it was kind of like, hey, you know, 30 minutes before we go on stage, you know, let's uh, <laughs> let's rally around in the dressing room. And uh, and let's go through the harmonies. Let's work through the harmony parts on on the song. So when you hit the stage, it's fresh in your mind. You kind of know, you know. When I what, one of the things I I you know live, um, you know, the obviously rehearsing of course is is important. But um, you know, we practice at home so we can rehearse with the band so we can perform it on stage. Right? Those are sort of the three parts of the thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, on stage, you, you feel a tension in your sort of a pressure in your throat that you kind of know is the right note. Um, and it's funny when I played with Al, when Al Petrelli was in Megadeth with us back in, uh, he came in in 2000, um, and, uh, through, through 2000, well, one, I guess, 2001. And I remember we had the, the in-ears and Al was very old school, grew up playing the clubs in New York. And of course, you know, played with Alice Cooper and big, big gigs and stuff. But he, I remember he'd always pull, man, I fucking hate these fucking things, you know, <laughs> pull them out <laughs> because he said, he goes, I'm old school. I hear my voice and the sound bouncing off the wall of the venue and coming back to me, you know, and I, and I got it because I've been on in-ears, you know, the in-ear monitoring for so long, really like walking around with headphones on, you know, you're thing right here but until you really got used to that but we adapted to that in 1994 us and Aerosmith and a few people got on board with that right away and it was very weird because initially it's it just like putting headphones on it just completely isolates you from the room you know you from see 10,000 people cheering and you can't hear them you know because it's like it's you get your <laughs> It's like it's you're like on a streaming. It is. It's weird. It was so weird. And then they figured out you could put audience mics up, which will kind of feed a little bit of the audience into your, into your ears. Into you your know. ears. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And the good, the good in ear mixers, you know, after this, in between songs, they'll actually feed your ego a little bit and turn those mics up so that you can hear the crowd cheering, you know, like, <sighs> I call it the Frampton comes alive moment. You the know, good sound. Something. Yeah. The good yeah. sound guy yeah. that, <laughs> you, you, does it, you know, exactly. <laughs> a very good sound so, guy. Does. There's a real art to mixing that. 
Um, I remember when we toured with the Scorpions, we were playing the O2 Arena in London, which is a huge room, big, big room. And um, there was a moment um, I was standing there, stage right, singing, and the sound I heard in my ears felt exactly like I was in that room. Like I could hear the delay as if it were bouncing off the room. The very thing Al Petrelli was talking about, our guy had mixed, uh, was mixing that well. And I, and I told him, I said, dude, like you just make being on stage a pleasure. Um, cause we all know those of us musicians, you know, we practice, it sounds great. We rehearse and then we get on stage and it just sounds terrible. You know, the big gig we're opening for kiss, you know, and then it just sounds terrible because <laughs> sounds our mix, shit. <laughs> yeah, you know, the mix isn't right. Um, you know, because it's so different. So, um, you know, we, it's, it, you know, the in-ear thing for, I think for, for me and certainly for Megadeth has brought a real comfort because every night that stage sounds pretty much the same, you know, um, there's little nuances, of course, is the floor carpeted or wood or steel or whatever. Is it indoor or outdoor? Or is it raining or sunny? You know, whatever. Makes a but difference all the time. It's, it's all a those different things. gig. All the, yeah. Whoop, someone's calling. Well, they can Phone call. Yep. There you go. They can wait. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was anticipating that. That's why I put my phone here. I figured someone always calls during a live stream. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, but Andy. those are, you know, those are just kind of things. Um, and, you know, now, I mean, it's so cool. Look, I've played on church gigs, you know, where it's like the the guys roll in with their in-ears. They got their little Mackie mixer. They got everything oh, dialed. Right. And I'm like, man, like you guys, you guys are rolling in like pros. Um, and, and I think the, the technology today and... Um, you know, uh, younger bands have, they've grown up with this technology, you know? Um, so they're, they're really into their ears. They're into their mixes. Um, I remember when we toured with Meshuga. I mean, they had all their lighting. They had everything all self-contained. They could roll in any gig and bang the Meshuggah show. Yeah, it was all yeah. in racks. and Two racks. And, then... and it's good to go. And that's just modern day, you know, adaptable touring. And I, I think that, that you can have a big production on a, on a, on a big look and big stages um, on a, on a much smaller budget and it still looks and competes, you know, with, with the big boys. Crazy. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Andy, good stuff. F fancy to give, uh, uh, that question to, to David about his big, big project. Yeah. You know what? Uh, can you tell us about, uh, uh, your David Ellison youth music foundation? That, that is very, yeah, that's very cool for us and we were talking about that me me and uh, and thomas i mean this is a kind of big thing and and uh you know just please talk it, about that sure know. sure well so it's a um it's it's a non-profit um and it, it's uh it was designed in the little town that i grew up in jackson minnesota um since i went off to hollywood and did okay for myself you know years later uh they they proclamated October 9th as uh, David Ellison Day back there. Um, and so uh, as we were celebrating that in 2018, I, I wanted to create something, a platform that would um, be able to give back, not just to that community, but to other, especially rural communities um, with the uh, with, with a foundation. And, and you know, initially we, we kind of... Um, set our focus maybe a bit more on some rural areas. You know, there's a lot of initiatives that really do well with um, the um, inner city schools. Uh, that obviously takes a lot of money uh, to do that. Things like, you know, places like Fender and things have, have done great with that. Um, the Grammys, it was ironic that we had, you know, we had finally taken home a Grammy after 12 nominations. We finally took one home yeah. in uh, 2000. Uh, 17 for the dystopia album and um we uh right at that same time the grammys had started a new uh, pillar to their organization called the grammy music education coalition and uh they were kind enough to bring us into that and you know by partnering with them they really helped us launch some big stuff out into the world um, and we started doing these big live streams last year, um, which quite honestly kind of kept it, got us connected to a lot of people to, 
you know, come in and play on the on the <laughs> No Karma record. On No Karma, um, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> it was just a great way to connect everybody early in the year. We started an initiative called Schools Out where uh, um, – where uh, initially it was me just sitting at home giving you know some free lesson music lessons to students around the world who uh, schools were closing because of the pandemic, and then I started tapping Andy. I don't know if you might have done some of that. I know I hit Nita Strauss. No, I didn't do that. No, we were you talking about yeah. that, but we were we were busy making an album. So I made you were busy. an album, and it was like <laughs> yeah, um, you know I hit Chris Kale from Five Figure Death Punch, and you know a whole bunch of people to kind of jump in on that, and and. Um, and that, and then we, you know, uh, you know, it, we were. I think what we realized is is probably because my reach through you know Megadeth and what I've been doing over the years is 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 global. Um, you know, to be able to reach right into the homes of of uh, students, you know, by way of technology, just like this, like we're doing here, yeah. um, allowed us to 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 really be hands on with helping give lessons and 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 that. So we feel like we've donated. Um, instruments um by way of jackson and harkey and you know some of my endorsements um they've 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 pitched in so we've donated equipment to various schools to musicians um we've um you know done the you know hand, hands-on one-on-one you know teaching um and i and i notoriously have not been a a, a guitar teacher a bass teacher <laughs> but uh i enjoy doing it you know um because and I don't have much time to do it, but when I do get little moments to do it, it's always fun, you know, um, and and to just sort of help take some someone from where they're at through a journey to go to the next level. Andy does this every day. He's he's a you know uh, president or vice a president of a teacher. music school. Yeah, so I mean he's a great teacher. Um, not only does he teach like a hundred kids a day, but then he writes six songs at night for <laughs> like me before almost, he goes to bed. Yes. You know, so <laughs> he's got a lot of energy. That's where that Italian espresso comes in handy over there. Must be, yeah. Must uh, maybe yeah. <laughs> he's drinking so much of your own coffee, you know. And not all, yeah, you know. Oh, he's got the good stuff over there. I've been to his house to drink that yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, hey, roast in peace is good too. But uh, yeah. Andy's got Andy's next level, I like it. man. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that foundation has been a great, um, way to, um, you know, again, just connect to, to students, um, and, and it, you know, just kind of something that just keeps sort of bubbling away sometimes in the background, sometimes in the foreground. And it's really just been a great, a great little endeavor to have. It is, it is really, it's a special, something's, I mean, special, you know, for, can you imagine, yeah. you know, being on the other side, you know, like just being the guy that. Gets to, to <laughs> got a know, lesson to from David to, Ellison. Yeah, to get a lesson from you or yeah, you know, like I, a, well, you know, right here, you know, Cisco just they granted us, they gave us a nice grant of these um, hardware, you know, with with video monitors and the technology to be able to do it. We're using their Cisco WebEx platforms that we could use, um, you know, as a way to integrate with that. So yeah, it's um, amazing. Yeah, su you know, super cool. You know, it's it's. I think education is one of those things that everybody gets excited about. Um, especially for youth and, you know, look, the last year, especially last year in particular was, was, a, was kind of a hairy one, you know, schools were closed, kids were home. Um, when I was in school, I couldn't wait to get home so I could play my bass, you know what I mean? So See? we, we had a captive exactly. audience, you know, it's like yeah, everybody's yeah, yeah. home. <laughs> let's get these guitars in their hands and let's get rocking, man. Let's, let's start getting some exactly, music going. Exactly. But, but same, yeah. you know, even for, for younger, you know, for kids or, you know, anyways, like younger people sometimes it, it takes you away from just being there and just only playing video games or just you know yeah, for sure your mobile for scrolling you know, your most, mobile you know up. the whole day yeah and it gives you something to believe in as well you know and and, and yeah. to express yourself and uh, some maybe be a rock star you never know you know or well and here's the truth new. of it is 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 uh and you know this, Andy, is is because you've done a lot of work with this. Is you know if you're into playing video games and you're into playing your guitar, the two marry very well because video games always need music, right? Yeah, so yeah. if you can get yeah, into exactly. writing music <laughs> for video games, yeah, voila, yeah. like you can actually actually make a bit of a living doing that, which is pretty cool. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. Just wanted to show you this. Uh, it's not a joke. It's the Ellefson Coffee and Co. So it made me laugh a lot because I thought Andy was mm, joking with me, but instead it's 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 true. It's true. 
I it love it. And it's good. Yeah. Yeah. It is true. <laughs> it is. Yeah. That's why I have the cup right it's so here. Fun. Yeah, that's why I have more people calling. Um, must be a coffee order, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> hey, let's have some of that coffee. Um, no, it's, it's uh, you know, it's funny how that started. Um, we had a production girl uh, that worked for Megadeth, and, and I was on the Shiprock cruise. She was there, and um, we are at, at the beach one day on the, on the cruise, and she says, man, I got to get you connected to this guy. I keep telling you about it. And I said, no problem. Look, when we get home, let's, you know, hook us up. So um, his name is Paul Wagoner, and he plays guitar in a band called Between the Buried and Me. And... Um, and he and his wife had a coffee roasting business over in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And so uh, the first coffee, um, and it's still our flagship coffee, is Roast in Peace. And um, he started doing that. I, I'm not going to lie. I wish I was like, Paul, handle it. Just, you know, here's the coffee, dark roast. Just send me a check. You know, like just, I thought it was going to be sort of like a, yeah, something you know, like that. a royalty. Yeah, like I'm busy being a musician and... This would be great. It'll be fun. I'll drink it. I'll promote it. Um, but the funny thing was, um, is we it, it blew up pretty quick because we we launched it at EllisonCoffeeCo.com online, and um, you know the good thing is is the first bag was profitable. You know we didn't dump a bunch of money trying to you know we're not competing with Starbucks. We're not doing that. We're a rock and roll coffee company. It's what we do. Exactly. And, and um, you're pretty much one of the first. Pro oh, I don't know if the first one doing that or. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, some other people have done, and Zach Wilde's got his coffee through Death Wish, Charlie Benante yeah. does coffee through Dark Matter. Um, so there's a few people that have, you know, that are that are doing it. I know Joey Kramer from Aerosmith, he, he kind of went all in. I mean, he, um, he had a pretty popular brand in uh, the New England area. Uh, he actually had, I think, a brick-and-mortar store. But I think he got out of it, um, you know, because it, it can be a hard climb, I'm not going to lie. And to be honest with you, I just wanted it to be simple, um, my son Roman pretty much runs the thing now, which is great. So oh, great. Um, yeah, keep it turn in the, the family, family business you know? over to the <laughs> Just, kid. Yeah, let him. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. he's he's doing that, and um, you know, so again, I'm I'm busy playing bass here and doing this stuff. So it's, yeah. uh, um, but it, it is cool, and we and we roast for a lot of other people. You know, autograph Skid Row, um, <clears throat> oh, Eddie cool. Ojeda from Twisted Sister. You know, so again, we roast coffee for them because it, it is fun. It's some some. Uh, it is. Uh, I sent some coffee to Jack Blades from Night Ranger. We we've been friends, and we, they were, they were in town playing, and, and I sent him some roast in peace. And he actually asked me for something very that's something I think we're going to roll out, which is like a half calf. Um, Jack's a pretty wired dude. He's he's got a lot of energy, you know. So uh, okay. <laughs> I can understand why he needs half calf, you know. So uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we actually made uh, made a special little care package for him and you know and it, it's kind of a fun thing to do you know to be able to like uh you know whip some coffee up for people and uh you know that's that's my love language yeah. is through a cup of coffee flavor of the destruction yes exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, we, and we drink that too much we drink a lot when we are on the road you know so yeah well in night ranger they got the best coffee dawn patrol because their album that'd be a great cup that'd be a great roast so you know yeah we've had some conversations so it, you know it's funny you got you know skid row we do the slave to the grind you know what I mean? Of course, so, yeah. Roast in peace. So, you mean, you know, all these rock and metal titles are perfect for coffee. Yeah. <laughs> David, you have a huge collection of basses. I mean, what are, what are the things you are looking for in an instrument, even working together with the Jackson bass for so long? What's the concept behind your signature bass in terms of design and specs? It, it, you have been designing bases for them, yeah. even not for your own model only, if I'm not mistaken. What's funny, you mentioned I just got a notification that popped up in a half hour. I have my design call with Jackson. So <laughs> good timing in your question. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we, we, we rally. I've been back with Jackson now for about 10, going on 11 years. And uh, of course, I had a big history with them. For, again, this base with Grover Jackson back in 87 through you know, into uh, a good part of the 90s and stuff. So, um, you know, look, I, I'm not a, I'm, I collect bases only to the degree that if I like it, I keep it. <laughs> um, but I'm not like a collector, you know. Um, I, I, I get things that I can use and sound good, you know. I remember setting out to go find a Gibson Explorer, and I couldn't find one, and I ended up getting an Ibanez Destroyer, which was the Ibanez knockoff of yeah. it. And, and it's freaking great. I love it. Marty Friedman played it on the Countdown to Extinction record. It's one of my favorite guitars I have. I was looking for a Gibson ES-335. This all back in, like, 1992. 
Um, I just kind of was on, I was guitar shopping while we were on the countdown to extinction tour. Um, and just going into guitar shops and pawn shops, even, you know, I, I wasn't looking to spend a ton of money. I just wanted to pick things up that played good. You know, I don't need prototype, you know, number one, hundred yeah, thousand yeah, yeah, dollar yeah. flying, you know, fuck all that crap, same, you know, cause then if it me. falls yeah, over, yeah. you break it. And if you get pissed <laughs> off and you throw your guitar, you just you cry, you grand down you the cry like yeah. a baby. Yeah. 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 Cause if they don't behave, you got to smack them around once in a while, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> can knock it off you know if it's humming or you know you're like what the hell bang you know yeah so, they get smacked uh, you know, quite enough what, and they sound better then if you beat them around a little bit yeah, for yeah. some reasons they sound better yeah exactly <laughs> exactly so for me it's always just function you know um you know it's it's like having a screwdriver a chisel a hammer a saw they're all just tools to you know to build the you know to do the construction yes. with, you know um you know look first of all tone You know, something that like, and, and honestly, I pick an instrument up and if it sounds good without being plugged in, I know fundamentally it has good construction. The tone is good. You know, this is a neck through, so it's not a bolt on. So, but you know, there's just certain things that about an instrument that it, either it plays good and it's kind of sounds good sitting in your lap, playing it or standing. That's the first thing. Because you know, you can always put pickups and other electronics in to, to pull out a, a, an amplified sound. Uh, guitar or bass that is so um, but then there's some things that I you know I picked up a Hamer 12 string mostly because I was a big fan of Cheap Trick and I found one here in town so I bought that um, you know I've got a Dean uh, uh, Flying V just because I think it, it looks freaking awesome you know the V headstock the V yeah, no, and that no, was no, just that. for me as a kid when Dean came out I was you know a teenager and I never had one so I finally got one um, and, and it's funny I bought it in 92 And I wrote that song, If You Were God. I took it back to my hotel room and wrote no that way. song, just fell <laughs> off the guitar. Yeah. And that's what I find. I find there's it's like there's songs in guitars. You know, I buy them. Same with that. I, I bought this. I couldn't find the 335, so I bought an Epiphone Sheraton. Uh, it was only like 400 mm. bucks. It was, you know, but I, I bought it from Sam Ash in New York. I took it back to my hotel room and just started writing songs with it. You know, so to me, uh, it's not just the tone. It Does it have music in it? You know, does exactly. it have, does, is there, is there a song in the guitar, you know? So, um, I got one five string over here that I, I send, I sent Andy a lot of bass riffs from, uh, right from this very room, you know, I'm, yeah, just, I'm sitting there playing it. And for some reason it's just, I can just, I mean, I'm not playing the Megadeth songs, but you know, I'm a, You know, it just kind of makes me want to play these arpeggio licks. Exactly. Um, yeah, so yeah. I go for that. If I need to, if I need to feel inspired, that song seems to kind of light a fire under me. Um, I've got a. Uh, it's funny. I got an, an ESP. It's it's like it's like the the cheaper version of an Alex Skolnick guitar. It looks like his doesn't say Alex Skolnick on it. And uh, I walked into a guitar. I was I literally going to call ESP and and buy a guitar from him. And I happened to walk into a guitar store here in Scottsdale, and there aren't many. There's like only a couple. And I walked in, and I just happened to see it, and I picked it up, and right away, I was like feeling it. So I said, "How much is it?" And, he, and I, it was cheap. It was like 250 bucks or 300 dollars. Like, and I was like, "Done." Swipe the credit card, and I've written more songs on that little 300 dollar guitar. So you know, to me, the the it's I find usually the stuff that doesn't cost as much makes me more money uh you know and, it, and yeah, it's yeah. never about the money it, but I, i've 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 made a lot more music from things that that they, they just feel good you know um i mean basses i've got an, a specter ns2 a pre kramer i've got a couple of a 76 and a 78 uh fender p basses um i got a couple of moduluses those are kind of my go-to for recording um, yeah i record with this one a lot um this one sounds really good on the stuff me and andy work on um you know i got a couple other ones here there's a the rust in peace five string jackson one um you know so that's you know that and this one here like this this one was something that i created to just be a new for 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 jackson because it's got kind of the fender headstock i wanted something that was a bit more traditional we you know jackson had never really done that before And I thought, you know, not everybody wants the pointy heavy metal headstock if you're playing country or you're playing in church or you're doing the, you know, <laughs> yeah. the bar mitzvah gig, you know. So, you know, to create bar something mitzvah. that you yeah, know, create course, something yeah. that's kind of the 
a base for everybody. So we created that, and I think that one like best in show at Nam. I mean, it was it, it sold very very well, four and a five string version. So, um, you know, to me with Jackson, you know, our goal was to really, you know, Jackson is a great guitar company. Um, oh, by the way, we have a bass, you know, kind of, and, and, and I wanted to change that. I wanted, I wanted Jackson to be known just as much as a company that's got great basses and things for everybody, you know, left-handed, right-handed, heavy metal, rock and roll. I mean, look, they're high octane, you know, they're meant to push the limit. Um, but I, I wanted there to be, um, I wanted there to be a, a, a full line of of stuff and i think we've we've accomplished that in the last 10 years and now we're really stepping on the gas to you know keep in, innovating and creating you know the next level stuff now for the next for the next decade here okay listen and david you i we know you're very busy even today and thanks a lot for your time i have just one last question because We are in love with Youngs and at Music Off we work together with many of them, especially nowadays with this um, project is named Music Off Young and mm -hmm. Andy is one of the biggest supporter of this, uh, this new project. And I will ask to you with your very long experience and this creativity and also a site that can go from music and uh, um, project with Youngs, etc. What advice can you give to young and aspiring musicians? Well, awesome. hopefully what people got from our little chat today is that we're just doing this because we love doing it, you know? Um, you know, that, that, that it, it always stops and starts there. And, you know, even today, all these years later, um, you know, it, it, I walk in this room and I look at a bass or a guitar and I go, let me pick that up and make some music today. You know, that hasn't changed since... I got that first Gibson EBO from my mom back in, you know, when I was 11 years old. So I think that's the benchmark, you know, um, I never looked at music as work. It's never been a job. And certainly, you know, you get hired. So on one level, it kind of is a job, you know, on some of those things, but I never look at it like that. I mean, there's, there's four letter words, you know, that aren't good. Uh, and work is one of them, <laughs> you know, the better one is play P L A I. That's a better four letter word, you know? So to me, go, go down that road. That's a lot more fun. Um, and even if you're hired to work for music, just remember you get, you get to play music, you know, um, you get to do this and, and have fun with it. And I think just fundamentally, um, You know, take some lessons. It's good to get some instruction to learn not only the fundamentals of, you know, like, you know, like learning, learning scales and some just musical fundamental things. Learn the notes on the neck. Um, kind of learn your, your instrument. And I look at, you know, music is a language, just like Italian, Spanish, French, English. It's a language. So if you're going to be, you know, if I was going to move to Italy, I'd have to step up my game and learn some Italian, you know. Um, <laughs> Which and is an easy I, thing. It's yeah, cool and I think if you're going to be a musician and you're going to hang out with other musicians, you, nerd, you, you need to learn the language of music, and that's important. And that's, an, that's a never-ending, lifelong journey. Um, so once you kind of learn your instrument, um, you know, then start playing with some other people. Uh, and I know that's kind of challenging during a pandemic, but start playing with some other people because every person I've played with regardless of their skill level, I've learned something from them. Um, even the most uneducated, maybe beginner musician, I've learned something from them. They've played a lick, exactly. they've done something, and I went, ooh, that's kind of cool. Um, and so you can learn from everybody. Um, and so that's, that's a big thing. And then, you know, from there... Um, you know, in the beginning, I say, you know, learn everything. Keep your focus very wide. And then as you go along in life, you know, you'll start to kind of narrow your focus and you'll focus in on the things that you really enjoy, that you like, maybe it's that you get paid for. Maybe it's something you're, you have an audience that wants to hear that from you and you can kind of narrow your focus in. And uh, it's just like in school, you know, in kindergarten, you learn everything. But by the time you go for your master's and your PhD, you're focused, you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, music sense. is kind of the yeah. same thing. Start wide. <laughs> 
and then you can learn to focus it in. Um, and you know, I think the main thing is, is just always enjoy. Just remember you get to play music. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> I'm sorry to say I have a very bad news because uh, um, while we were playing and kidding and talking, we just re received the bad news that Chikoria just passed away. Oh no! Um, about oh, no. minutes ago, we got oh. the news. So I just wanted to share it with you, even if it's another gender, no you know, a musical gender is a, a, another yeah. iconic musician. And we lost something and we lost a lot maybe today. You know, so I sat behind I Chick at a Grammy Award back in maybe 2014. And uh, of course, you know, I, I grew up playing in jazz bands through middle school and high school. And of course, Stanley Clark is one of my favorite bass players. Um, and I've kind of stolen a little tone from him <laughs> i love him and of course his work that he did with chick and um you know to sit right behind chick i'm like that i'm like dude i'm like literally an arm's length from royalty right now you know and uh mm -hmm. um you know so it's well that's you know condolences to his family and yeah, everyone indeed. around the world for that yeah that he was one of the great ones and a real sweet seemed like a sweet wonderful soul you know who just made some amazing music he'll definitely be missed absolutely yeah yeah I was Absolutely listening to, to Chick Corea Electric Band yesterday. Yeah. Really? <laughs> to be, you know? Yeah. And I was suggesting one of my students to, to listen to that, that to, yeah. to get some, to get out of his kind of comfort zone, you know? And, uh, so. Well, the yeah, beauty the of it is, is we you know, so with many music, music to listen. Yeah, the beauty yeah. with music is that is, is, and that's the beauty of being a recording artist, is we, re, you know, we leave a piece of our legacy behind, you know? So once we leave the planet, Uh, our music stays uh, for, for people to enjoy and learn and live from from there. So, um, you know, maybe that's a good closing remark. Go record as much music as you can. Do it now. Do it. It will yeah. stay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, David, for your time. It, welcome, it has been a, an amazing opportunity to meet you. And I'm looking forward to meet you in Italy the, as soon as will be possible because of this pandemic situation. And I'm sure we'll be enjoying our time with Andy <laughs> and a good big bottle of wine. <laughs> of course. You know? of course. Well, I've been trying to get to Italy sure. like twice now this year, and every time it just never seems to work. You know, we've, me and Andy have been keeping a look on the 14-day uh, quarantine calendar yeah. to see when that goes away. <laughs> just you know, checking okay. about flights. Okay, can I fly? Can I just, oh, no. I know, week, I know. Because <laughs> as much as, look, this works doing it, you know, across the Internet, and we're lucky we have the technology and the, and the skill and aptitude to do it, you know. But there's nothing like sitting in the room i mean me and andy and alessio when we finished the megadeth tour back in uh, february last year we were over in europe with uh, five finger death punch and we finished and me and andy we met up in at alessio studio up in wembley, in wembley um yeah. and just sat there and i mean literally in, in an hour and a half we like ripped through five tunes man it was just exactly. the creativity just fell out and it was just five you know? those are so cool you know and it's uh so th those are moments i still long for you know um Oh, and oh, sorry about that. Those are moments that I, I still long for because it, it, it is it's it's you know we're not meant to be isolated and alone. You know we're meant to no, be exactly connected yeah. and uh, we're doing the best we can with digital here obviously. But yeah. uh, our best <laughs> uh, you know our I think our best moments are when we're when we're in the room together. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> indeed. Okay. Stay stay here a second so we can say we can have a proper goodbye uh, okay. i will just close the live streaming now thank you very much guys for being with us with evit delefson and andy martangelli let's see if we will have an, a new live stream on uh, this tuesday and this tuesday next tuesday how to make music in streaming and be alive after that will be a tutorial for for help people to have this kind of conversation with others and play your music even if we cannot now so it can be tricky sometimes to start with it but we can get over it and have some fun at least until the, the when we will be back playing live and meet people and have some rehearsal together etc thanks a lot for being with us see you soon